um, as the moderator and uh, sort of uh, didactic personality that I am, I would like to just start by going over a few elements of the history of book publicity and marketing. Going back to my childhood, when I started at Simon & Schuster, and uh, in those days, I want to say, for those of you who, weren't, who don't remember, weren't born yet, book publicity and marketing was extremely different than it is today. It's just, it was in the dark ages uh, of book publicity in the sense that uh, you would not see uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway on the Today Show. Uh, <laughs> the closest you could get to him would be like an interview in the Paris Review by George Clinton. That was considered to be really uh, amazingly interesting, and it was. And all the great writers of that era in the 50s and early 60s wanted to be in the Paris Review because uh, they, uh, it made them human. It, it gave them a chance to say things to their readers. The whole concept of an author connection, uh, of a connection between authors and readers in those days, it just wasn't possible. All the publicity was organized and run by the publisher. And uh, in those days, for example, when I joined uh, Simon & Schuster in 1962, fresh out of college, I was only eight years old, I was, uh, the biggest thing we had going was Joe Heller's Catch-22. And no one knew who Joe Heller was or ever saw him anywhere. But uh, his, his personality and his book was strictly on the page. And whatever we did in the, in the house was uh, simply to uh, reach the media and to reach uh, potential re book reviewers who would promote the book in the New York Times Book Review and elsewhere. There were a lot of review media. The New York Review of Books was just starting out during a newspaper strike. And that's how you sold books. That was basically it. Now, in 1965, <laughs> bear with me, I'll go, I'll go faster. A major event occurred. An author named Chaim Binat, does anybody know that name? Was on the Jack Parr show. Now, Jack Parr was a pretty smart guy. And Chaim was the first author who went on a TV show and talked about his books. He was very charming. And he was on many times because he spoke on the subject of parenting. And the name of the book was Between Parent and Child. And it was a revolutionary book in its day because it said that parents should listen to children. They should be firm and disciplined, but not be discouraging, uh, be positive in their, in their child raising, and generally um, respect their children. That was, a, that was a really a, a radical book for its era. But the thing about Chaim was that he was he was entertaining, he was charming, and he was the first author to show that, hey, authors could walk and talk at the same time and, and chew gum and, and, uh, and, and, were, and were fun. They could be fun. So that was around the time that uh, that began, 1965, as if in the Millen Company then, although Chaim was not my author. I knew him, and he was really a great guy. Now, then in 1970, a really another revolutionary event occurred. A woman named Jacqueline Suzanne wrote a book called Valley of the Dolls. You're nodding your head. Well, this is a pretty famous book. But Jackie Suzanne was the first author who actually kind of marched into a bookstore, put out her hand, introduced herself to the staff, and said, hi, I've got this great book. You want to hear about it? And people listened to her, and they invited her to speak, and people came to the store so she could autograph the book. This was a radical idea. Authors in the book retail business, in, the, in the, what was not then known, but in the brick and mortar store. And then she began going on tours, first at her own expense, but then Bantam started sending her around. And the next thing you knew, it was customary for authors to go on book tours. So the media appearances in the book tours were now firmly in, in trend, entrenched. Now, from the next 25 years, you might call the golden age of traditional book publicity. All books were sold by media and author appearances. And the whole, the whole uh, business of publicizing a marketing book really expanded. It became you know, higher paid, and more women came into the business. And notice how many, we were saying how many women are in this room. When I was a kid, there were no women in book publishing. I mean, really, it was a gentleman's club. You know, Bennett Cerf, and Alfred Knopf, and Dick Simon, and Max Schuster. That was it. A bunch of you know, 
cunning, crafty Jews, and Nelson Doubleday, <laughs> the only guy who was not a member of the, you know, the, uh, the Mishpoka. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it, it really changed. Women, women rose. For, they were permitted more to be in marketing, and they were better at it because they were nicer, and more charming, more personable, and they did well at it. And that was during that golden age of, of book marketing. Uh, I worked with Nina Bourne. Nina Bourne, everybody knows, she, she recently died. She was uh, practically 100 years old. And she was the, worked with Bob Gottlieb and then went to Knopf. And, and she really, really understood how to customize every single book to its market. And she was, she was really the genius of that era. Uh, however, I want to point out, because this is an important uh, thing that we'll be coming back to, is during this golden era of book publishing, Mm, the, goal, the rule of thumb was that 80% made up for 20%. You all know what that means? 80% of all books lost money. And the truth is, uh, if you talk to the salespeople, it was more like 90%. 90 to 95% of everything we published, despite all the brilliant marketing and publicity and sales and jacket covers and fabulous efforts that we made, we failed. The book business is... It is, it makes up for its many, many, many failures by its successes. Michael, you agree with that. I know. We've talked about it many times. So what's going on here? What's going on is that even though we're all wonderful, bright professionals and love the business and otherwise would be in a different business, we actually don't know what we're doing. We don't know what's going to sell. We get swept up by passion and enthusiasm, and we love what we do, and we love our books, mostly. Sometimes we publish them because we need something on the list, but we love our stuff, and, but we're never really, nobody can predict. It's not a science, it's an art, okay? And no one can tell what the reader will react to or respond to. It's the reader who ultimately makes that decision as to what sells and what doesn't, not us, no matter how big an advance we pay or how clever we are in our publishing and publicity and marketing. So by 2005, a new event started to occur. 2005, I picked that out as sort of an arbitrary date. That's when Google started. And a whole uh, incredible new uh, series of events that were apparently unrelated, were unrelated, but added up to a new era began. Some of the early names were like Asian Avenue, Black Planet, Migente, uh, uh, SciWorld, Friendster, Match.com. Some of it was simply websites for people who were looking for a date and so forth. And this gradually developed into what we now know as the internet. And for the first time, it became possible for strangers to meet each other without an intermediary and without ever meeting each other in reality, but only online. And this began what, what is now the revolution in book marketing. Um, a, a whole new sort of democratic, egalitarian, bottom-up event occurred, which gra gradually but definitely established an unobstructed path with no gatekeeper between the author and the reader. And authors began doing what we now demand that they do, those of us, I believe, who've been in the conventional part of the business for several years now, we expect authors to have an online presence, to have a website, a blog, to be willing to reach out and comment on other people's blog, to begin to, begin to customize their platforms so that there's a new definition of a platform which includes you know, having a, a YouTube, having a video, having a podcast, having whatever works, having extended... Uh, data for your own work of fiction that goes beyond the original book and offers new information that will enhance the book and the reading experience and entice more readers. So the whole process of book marketing and book publishing has, and book publicity has really changed. However, I will say that most books still lose money and <laughs> most books, are, you know, there's still this draconian returns policy. It's getting worse all the time. Books come, you know, come back in three weeks now or two weeks. It's just really brutal. It's not improving, and we're and we're, we're still a marginally profitable, barely, you know, fingernails on the cliff, uh, survival mode of business. And, and why are we all doing this? Well, because we care about ideas, because books are weapons or instruments of social change, and because we love to read and we love working with writers. I'm speaking for myself. 
So things are changing, and that's what we want to talk about today. I also want to say, as a uh, as a uh, observer uh, from the inside, that the advent of self-publishing has been a monumental event. Originally, a vanity operation that was considered to be for lunatics and people who couldn't get a, a, a you know contract with anybody. It's now become a thriving and viable way of publishing books. And uh, some very fine books have been launched that way. Some have been converted to commercial publications. And some authors have wanted to keep them as self-published books because they make more money, they have more control, and they just prefer not to have to deal with the book business, which sometimes isn't very quick to respond or welcome. So agents and publicity people uh, progressive agents and progressive publicity people, if I may say, many here in this room, have, a, have accommodated that. There are now agents, as you'll hear from Ariel, who represent self-published authors. Uh, Jim Levine, uh, Jane Distel, and others, or uh, Ed Victor in, in England and London and, and New York, are beginning to represent self-published books. And self-publishing authors are beginning to hire freelance publicity agents to help them design websites, create an online presence, customize their websites in order that they can uh, you know, reach their niche audiences online, which they can do, fiction and nonfiction. It's, a, it's really a brave new world. It's very exciting. As an old geezer myself, I find it so interesting and stimulating to see the wonderful changes and opportunities. In many ways, I do feel this is like the most exciting time to be in the book business ever. So um, let's see, uh, given, the, given the premise that things have changed a lot, but some things remain the same, we still have to have a good book, we still don't know what a good book is exactly, <laughs> and we never know exactly what's gonna sell, I'd like to introduce, let the panel introduce themselves, then I'll ask a few questions, and then we have until two o'clock, which is more than an hour. I think we'll have plenty of time for everybody to have their two cents.